Hey guys, Unit522 here, and before the video begins, there's a couple of announcements I want to make real quick. Starting today, I'm now accepting photography submissions. If you have a creepy picture you want featured in one of my videos, feel free to send it to my email. They can be photos of dark street corners, creepy looking houses or buildings, or maybe you can get a friend to stand outside your house with a mask on. Just generally creepy photos I can place in my videos while the stories play. Be sure to include in the email your name, or your preferred nickname you want as a display credit. I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys come up with. Be creative, and remember to stay safe. Also, while I have your attention, I would like to give a shout out to Synthetic Alien. He is the artist who has provided the amazing thumbnails I use in almost all of my videos. He accepts commission work, so if you have a thumbnail that you want customized, be sure to keep him in mind. Links to all of his stuff can be found in the description. So now that we have all that out of the way, let's get on with the stories. Number 1 This story takes place two years ago, when I was still in primary school. I was 12 at the time. There was this organization for young girls who needed help building their self-confidence and basically have fun while they still could. Because once we got to high school, the activities wouldn't be arranged anymore. One day there wasn't many girls, so the leaders, we'll call them Lisa and Beth, decided just to bring the class to the playground next to the school where we went twice a week. It was around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. At the opposite end of the playground is a row of houses. There was a woman, maybe in her late 30s, and a boy, about 7 years old, in the corner. They both had dark hair and looked to be of Asian descent. I don't remember what they were doing exactly, but I just got a very uneasy feeling. I didn't really like the woman and didn't want to get very close to her. She just seemed so odd in her mannerisms and gave me the creeps. But luckily they stayed in the corner and I stayed close to Lisa and Beth, so I figured it would all be okay. We played for about 15 minutes before we took a short break. I was just randomly looking in the direction of the fence when I noticed a boy at the end of the playground behind the fence. He was about 25 feet from the mother and the other boy. He looked about the same age and had blonde hair. I thought this was odd, as this young child was there all alone. I suddenly noticed the mother walking towards one of the houses on the opposite side of the playground, and I spotted the two boys approaching each other. I turned around to tell Lisa about them, when suddenly my friend Jody ran past me, crying hysterically. Lisa began to panic at Jody's behavior, and asked what was wrong. Before they could get a straight answer out of her, I heard a scuffle and noticed the two boys were now locked in a physical altercation. Then I noticed the woman returning from the house, and my blood went ice cold. She was holding a large knife in her hand and was heading directly towards the boys. All the girls in my group ran out of the playground. Two of them were crying, and I stood paralyzed and shaking. Convinced, I was going to witness a woman stabbing what appeared to be a seven-year-old boy to death. Beth began moving quickly towards the woman to intercept her, and Lisa went to break up the fighting boys. When Beth asked the woman why she had the knife, she just laughed sarcastically and said something about cutting down some branches to make a treehouse. That made no sense at all because it was in the middle of autumn, so there were branches all over the ground. Lisa called the police, and we were all told to move further away for safety. Ten minutes later, we noticed red and blue lights coming from the distance. I tried confronting Jody, who was still crying, but I was having trouble keeping a brave face myself. After being confronted by Beth, the strange woman had gone back in the house to put the knife away. I guess she got the sense the police were on their way. After the police arrived, she was interviewed but wasn't taken into custody, probably because there wasn't enough evidence to arrest her. The mother of the second boy eventually arrived and held him tight. I don't know why she left him alone there. I assume he just walked away from her and she lost him. So that's my story. I still don't know what she was planning on doing with that boy who was fighting her son, but with such a large knife, her intentions could not have been good. 
Number two. When this happened, I was about 12 or 13. I was staying the night at my friend Rose's house and her mom left us to care for her little sister while she went out for a few hours. Being the good babysitters we were, we decided to head over to a local park that had a playground just to hang out for a while and let her sister play. We had been there for about 30 minutes and we were just hanging out and pushing her little sis on the swings when two guys showed up and sat at a picnic table close to the playground. The first guy looked to be in his teens, probably 5'10", short dark hair, brown eyes, and medium build. But the other guy had to have been in his early 30s. He was very large, probably at about 6'1", 250 pounds, and had a full beard and shoulder length curly hair with green eyes. We noticed when they sat down, but didn't really give them a second thought. Apart from their age and physical appearance, there was nothing that really stood out about them. Until the older guy, whose name was Chris, decided to start a conversation with us. At first, he asked us our names and gave us theirs, and then asked what we were up to today. Still being the polite kid I was raised to be, I answered him, but I kept my answer short and continued to play with Rosa and her sister. He kept asking questions like where we were heading later, and rather we wanted to hang out with him and his nephew, who was the younger guy, whose name I can't remember, all the while getting closer and closer to us as he was talking. We told him that we were just going home after Rose's sister was done playing, and that we weren't allowed to go anywhere else. He then offered me some beer that he had with him, and asked me if I smoked. I had never drinking any alcohol at that point, and I wasn't about to start then, so I declined his offer. He then told me how pretty I was and asked me if I had a boyfriend, and without skipping a beat, told me that he had recently just gotten out of jail and was looking for a girlfriend. I told him that I didn't have a boyfriend and I wasn't interested in having one either. During this whole interaction, he would occasionally address his attention to his nephew, and from the interactions that they had, I quickly caught on that they were in a gang, which is when I actually started getting nervous, as even I knew that you didn't mess with the people in the local gangs. I knew that we had to be careful about what we said next. He was quiet after that, and I figured that they were going to move on and bug someone else, but I was wrong. He then asked me again what we were going to do later, and if we wanted to hang out with them instead telling us how much fun we would have and how they could buy us beer or whatever we wanted. I told him again we couldn't go anywhere and we had to watch Rose's little sister. Then he went quiet again. I know we should have just picked up and left right then, but I had just started getting into my rebellious stage and thought we could handle these guys, no problem. And they weren't really a threat. We weren't ready to go back to Rose's house just yet and we went and sat on another picnic table, thinking that if we ignored them, they would get the hint and go away. Of course, not one minute later, Chris and his nephew came and sat with us. His nephew stayed at one end of the table, but Chris decided to come sit right next to me and started telling me again about how pretty I was and how he could be my boyfriend and we should just go and hang out at his place or wherever I wanted to go. At this point, his nephew started looking kind of nervous. He was very casually chatting with Rosa, but I could tell he realized how young we were and that his uncle was really starting to cross the line. He told him he thought they should go do something else because Rosa and I couldn't go anywhere, but Chris wasn't having any of that. I don't remember what he said next as he was still sitting next to me. But the next thing I know, he puts his arms around my shoulders and pulled me into his side. I was completely caught off guard and didn't even know how to react. I had never had an older guy that close to me, let alone touch me like that. I know I should have at least pushed him away or done something, but I just froze. He kept saying again and again how he could be my boyfriend and he would take good care of me, asking me if I could go somewhere with him but I told him no and started trying to slowly get out from under his arm without making a big deal out of it. At that moment, I started getting scared 
as he was getting really pushy and I didn't want to piss him off as it was just us in the park and I couldn't see or hear anyone else around. He then pulls me closer to him and this time he kissed me. It wasn't just a quick little peck, it was a forceful, lingering kiss that completely threw me off. My mind started racing. I couldn't believe what just happened and even Rosa was just sitting there with a look of complete shock on her face. I decided that I had enough of this and we had to get out of there. I pulled away one last time and he told me again we should go somewhere to have some fun. He wasn't very creative and just kept saying the same things over and over again. Just wording them slightly different. It was now very obvious what he had on his mind. I told him that it was getting late and we had to get Rose's little sister home as her mom was going to be back soon. He didn't seem very happy with hearing that so I told him that we had to take her sister home but maybe we could come back and hang out with him some more. It was obvious he didn't want to let me go but I promised that we would come back. Finally, I guess he either believed me or just decided to let me up so I could go get Rosa's little sister to carry her home. I had just turned around and was getting ready to tell Rosa that we had to leave now. And suddenly he changed his mind and stood up and came over to me. I had just put Rosa's little sister down for a moment as she was getting kind of heavy for me and I knew that we had a ways to walk so I wanted to give my arms a break for just a second. He took that opportunity to grab me from behind and pull me into him, kinda like a bear hug with his whole body pressed up against mine. A whole flood of emotions ran through me at that moment, fear, confusion, and still a bit of denial that he would really do something to hurt me. But I knew it was wrong either way and I needed to get the hell away from him. I was still kinda in a state of shock at the time, but I knew I had to keep my wits about me. I decided to play along and try to work out a way for him to let us leave without making him mad or think I was lying to him. I told him again that we had to go and that Rosa's mom would get mad and come looking for us, but I promised him that we would just drop her sister off and come back. He let me go, but still didn't seem convinced. I told him again as convincingly as I could that we had to take Rosa's sister home and told him just to wait for us there. He seemed to have bought it, so we quickly started walking back to Rosa's house while he and his nephew were sat at the table. As we started walking, I glanced back and saw his nephew trying to get him to leave again. So I thought, great, they're leaving, so there's no way they're going to see where we're going or follow us. Wrong. Just as I thought they were leaving in the opposite direction, Chris decided to follow us. We had a bit of a head start but he was a really big guy and was gaining on us quickly. We hurried as fast as we could because we didn't want him to see where she lived. So once we got on her street, we took off running. We finally got back to Rosa's apartment and thought we were in the clear. I could hear Chris calling out my name, but I couldn't see him. So we all went inside as quickly and as quietly as we could. Once inside, we all went over to the window I could still hear Chris calling out my name and getting really close so we decided to stay quiet and carefully watch from the window to see if they had seen where we went. Luckily they kept walking past Rosa's apartment. We both breathed a huge sigh of relief and then started freaking out cause neither of us had ever experienced anything like that before but we were so glad it was over and we were in the clear. Shortly after that Rosa's mom got home and we went out to meet her in the parking area. Neither of us had any intentions of telling her what happened as Rose's mom wasn't the nicest and we were sure we would have gotten into trouble even though we didn't do anything wrong. We all get back upstairs and we're just chatting with Rose's mom and her younger brother. Then we heard a knock at the door. My heart stopped as I could swear I heard Chris's voice on the other side of the door. We both went back into the kitchen as Rose's mom went to answer the door. It was Chris and his nephew again. Somehow they must have seen us when we went out to meet her mom in the parking lot and saw which apartment we went into. They asked Rose's mom if we were there, but luckily we were smart enough to give them fake names. And even then, Rose's mom was having none of that. 
and told them to get the hell out of there and slam the door in their face. Of course, Rose's mom knew something was up and asked us if we knew them, but we weren't about to admit that and we just told her that we had no idea what was going on or who they were. I don't think she really bought it, but she left it at that and told us not to answer the door. Later that evening, her mom was going out again, so it was just Rosa and I in the apartment. We were just hanging out in the living room, talking about how crazy that afternoon turned out to be and how glad we were that we didn't get into any trouble. And then we heard it. Two voices that sounded very familiar, just outside the window. I was terrified to even move. And then came a knock at the door. There was no way that we were going to answer it. So we just kept as quiet as possible and prayed they would just go away. They called out our names and tried knocking again. Then one of them tried turning the doorknob. Thankfully, Rose's mom had locked it on her way out. They tried knocking one more time. What we heard next was their footsteps walking away from the door. We never saw either of them again, and we didn't go back to that park again for quite some time. It was an incredibly surreal experience. However, I will never forget his face, the feel of his body against mine, or that he reeked of cigarettes and beer. Number 3 When me and my best friend were younger, we would ask our babysitter to take us to the school playground at night so we could play hide and seek. We lived in a small town where everyone knew everyone and we were friendly with one another. So this wasn't abnormal or dangerous, at least not at the time. One night we went over past our bedtimes, but our parents were cool and let us stay up to play hide and seek. At one point, I was trying to find my friend and my babysitter. As I looked for them, a car slowly drove by the playground. Their lights were off and the windows were tented. I watched them as they drove by and felt as though they were watching me. When they were out of sight, I instantly forgot about it and went back to seeking. It came to be around midnight and our babysitter thought that it was about time to go. Of course, we begged to stay a little longer but he said it was late. We started to walk up the hill that was behind the school. We then all heard a car behind us and we look over to see the same car driving on the grass towards us. My babysitter instantly grabbed both of us and threw us over his shoulders and started running towards the bushes that cut us off from the other street. The car started to speed up and so did my babysitter. When we got to the bushes, my babysitter forced us through and up a metal fence behind them. I ended up getting cuts everywhere, but worst of all I cut my leg on the fence and was bleeding badly. I could hear the driver of the car calling out to us, asking in a kind voice, Where are you? Then in a serious and scary voice, I know you're in there. I'm gonna find you. <laughs> we ended up getting to a house that had lights on and our babysitter banged on the door begging to let us inside and that he had kids and one of them was bleeding. A woman who we knew as Emily opened the door and pretty much dragged us inside and shut the door behind her. Later that night, the police were called and I was sent to the hospital to get stitches and a shot for the rusty metal I had cut my leg on. It doesn't end there though. Later that week, my dad was watching the news as usual and a story came up. It showed the playground that we were at a couple of nights ago and showed two medics rolling a body covered with a white sheet into an ambulance. The girl had been dead for a couple of days and her body hadn't even been there for very long. The killer was never found, so he could still be out there. Sometimes I wonder if the man in the car did get us, would we have been in the same situation that girl ended up in and she would have been watching the news to see our bodies being rolled into an ambulance. It makes me feel guilty, but I will never, and have never, stepped another foot in that playground since. There's always a reason to be afraid.